So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in the user experience and product management career paths talk with Karen Donoghue from Human Logic and Laura Holly from Olympus. We will take one A at the end, but you can during the talk you can just send the questions through chat. So thank you and welcome Karen and Laura and I'll leave the video to you. Okay, thank you, Asla. Uh, I'm Karen Donahue, and uh, Laura Hawley is here with me, and we're really excited to present to you today. Thank you for inviting us. This is UX and product management career paths. I'm Karen. I'm a founder of Human Logic, which is a user experience design practice, and I've also developed an air quality monitoring app called Local Haze. I've had a long career in technology and product design and user experience, and I've written a few books on user experience business books. The new one is on the right called Envision Product. And uh, in addition to being a Tufts computer science alum, I'm an MIT Media Lab alum. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm also delighted to, to be here today and have the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, I'm Laura Holly, and I am currently the global head of digital solutions at Olympus Medical. Um, in this division, we produce a number of software-based products like computer-aided diagnosis for detecting things like polyps and cancerous lesions, uh, workflow software that help clinicians be more efficient in the operating room or other procedure spaces, and collaboration software supporting real-time collaboration and really collaboration between clinicians and patients um, across the, the patient journey. Um, so what this means is uh, I'm responsible for running that business. I'm uh, the general manager, if, if you will, uh, and I have divisions of product managers and strategic marketing people um, on, on my team. So that's that's what um, my current role is. I, I have spent many years as a as a product manager in big companies and and small companies. Um, did a little bit of consulting, which is where uh, I ran into to Karen in the uh, Cambridge uh, arena. Um, I uh, took my um, initial uh, education at, at Smith College, and so I came to this very technical field with a liberal arts um, a background, and, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about our paths uh, later on. Um, and uh, I guess uh, outside of work, I, I like to spend time in, with the Boston Product Manager Association. I am involved with the mentor program there. Uh, and uh, take care of my, my German Shepherds. So I uh, look forward to talking with you a little bit more about product management um, over the course of the next hour. Thank you. Okay, so product. What does it mean to work in product? Well, to me, it means shipping products. So designing, building, and shipping products. And we're gonna look today at product management and user experience. Those are two product roles, but there's also engineering. We're not going to cover that today, but just so you know, product management and user experience are two of the disciplines in product. And I see them as intersecting like the circles at the right. So PM is product management, UX is user experience and engineering, and they do overlap in a lot of ways. So we're going to take a look at what's involved in shipping a new product. So this is a product that Laura led as product management leader, and I was a designer. It's called Improvata Cortex, a secure healthcare communications technology released in Boston and very successful product in the market. So um, this slide is a little bit busy, but but I wanted to show it because, um, you know, let's look at the steps that are involved in shipping um, a product. And, and you'll notice I use the term product realization here. Karen spoke a minute ago about shipping products. Um, that really is a very important um, component about you know creating products and getting them to the point where they can ship. Um, but also as a product manager, involvement in the product goes way beyond shipping, right? You're there uh, really from the beginning of, of products. So in the ideation phase, um, as, as you may know, it's um, quite easy to come up with lots of ideas. Um, there also is in the process of developing a product, the assessment phase, right? Um, there are always constraints on um, the, the amount of time and resources you have with R&D or engineering. And so you have to make decisions about what to do next. And so um, this is also a you know, really important component. You know, oh, oh, sorry, um, just wanted to mention the timeline on this, Laura, is really long. It can be like six months or a year. And it's really good. And one of the things that I come out of this uh, talk is in a for the roles I'm talking with you about and a bit kind of product kind of company and so and so you can you know design 
very quickly in the matter of a month. Um, and and, and um, you know, some some products can take years of, of development and, and getting to the point of launching. So it, it's a good point. There is a lot of variability there. Mm. But nonetheless, um, you know, really getting a product to the point when it's ready to ship is is a big deal, and there are lots of folks involved. So underneath of the, the timeline, if you will, I wanted to call out just a, a couple of those stakeholders. Um, you know, there are lots of folks within the context of, of a company that will have input into the product. The, these may be um, colleagues in sales, uh, in marketing, it may be, you know, your CEO, depending on, on the, the kind of company that, you, that you're involved with. And then there are folks um, a bit, you know, outside, if, if you will, and, and these could be um, users, these or prospective users. Um, these could be key opinion leaders like uh, analysts and so forth who, who may you know cover your space in, in great detail. And so they're, they're involved very much at the beginning. And then you know let's kind of shift um, to to the roles that, that Karen was talking about. There's there's UX and design and R and D or engineering, depending on on your industry. You, you know you may you may refer to it as, as something different. But also very involved with you as a product manager um, at the early stages of development, early stages as well as um, you know planning and and development. But but let me call your attention to to sort of the last row, which is product management and. As a product manager, you are involved from the very beginning of products um, till the very end. As, as I say, you know, from from the birth of products and and really through the um, product lifecycle management, or you know, you you bring products into the world and, and you take them out. Um, you know, sometimes you you end of life products, and and these are all really important uh, focuses for product management as well. Okay, so here's a diagram that shows the overlap between business users and technology. When I think about user experience. I think that user experience lives in the intersection between these needs, the business needs, business requirements, users needs, what people want when they use your product and the technology, the type of technology, the constraints of building the technology. So with that in mind, what does user experience mean in the real world? Well, on the left, you'll see a list of the kinds of activities that you do as a UX designer. And UI is also sometimes interchangeably used, but really UI is about what the user interacts with on the screen and maybe what the screen looks like and the pixels and, and that kind of interaction level. But the user experience is the entire experience of the product to achieve some kind of value. And as a user experience practitioner, you're gonna be envisioning, designing and realizing products from the point of view of the end user. So keeping that in mind, designing new products or maybe improving existing products, products that might be having problems in the market. And you're always gonna be working and navigating against constraints, whether they're the fact that the product's already released and so you have constraints of the product development that you have to work within or organizational constraints. And you're also gonna work on many, many form factors. So you might work on phones, laptops, tablets, glasses, wearables. And when I talk about form factor, I'm just gonna show you some examples. This is a phone that I worked on. This is a Razer 2 from Motorola. It's a, you may not have seen this phone, but it's a clamshell phone. And this phone, really required many, many different um, types of practitioners in product and design and hardware to get this product released and shipped into the market. This is a wireless photo frame from Kodak called the Easy Share. The frame channel service, which is what I worked on, is was delivering content to this wireless picture frame that you might have in your kitchen or in your bedroom. So it's a home device and that's a form factor, very different from a phone, but a, a definite form factor. And this is the Mesa Little keyboard. Uh, it's a two octave wireless keyboard designed for iPad. And working with engineering, I worked on the uh, iPad application to allow for setup and configuration of this keyboard. So musicians could use the keyboard with music applications and music product production applications to make music. So this is a different form factor. These are all products. Uh, and I just wanted to see what that meant in terms of design. Good. So uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, so so what does a, a product manager really do? Um, and as I, as I mentioned a minute ago, it, it depends. It depends a bit on the type of product you're working on, right? Being a product manager for a consumer goods product versus, um, you know, maybe, you know, a, a, a jet um, 
you know, or a medical device is, is really is really different. They're really different from one another. The type of company that, that you work for, the size of the company in, in some regards, um, you know, the type of industry, um, and, and also where you are in the product life cycle. So, for example, if you're in the ideation phase with your product, you're going to spend a lot of time out talking to customers. Um, prospective users and so forth. Um, if you're at the point of launching a product, you're really going to be speaking to key opinion leaders, probably uh, doing a lot of launch events and those kinds of things. So it really depends. And the last piece, of course, depends a bit on the supporting cast. So I have been a product manager in some companies where I didn't have design like like Karen to support us. And so there you'll be you'll be doing some of that work on, on your own. Um, so so it really depends. Um, but what I wanted to note here is that for me, product management really means that, that you wear lots of hats. And, and uh, I have a slide a little bit later on where we'll talk about some of, some of those hats. But, but there's a great deal of variety and there's a great um, deal of, of span of responsibility uh, in, in the product management field. But there are a couple things that are, that, that are always the case, right? And that is you are the one on the product realization team who needs to have you know the best understanding of what your product is what it does who your users are what market you're playing in and you know what is your competition doing right you need to know those things better than anybody else right regardless of of where you are so so those are are, are some of the things um, that factor into to what product management does why don't we go to the next slide karen so in my career, I spent much of my career as a consultant with my own practice. So on the left-hand side are all the companies that I've been working with recently. And some of these are really big engagements. They can be six months or a year working on different products. And on the right in that box are um, places where I've worked as a full-time employee. I worked at RGA in, in Hollywood as a designer. Motorola, I was a staff designer. Microsoft, Savage, uh, which was a Java mobile phone platform. I was an in-house user experience director there. But I just wanted to show you that there's a variety when you're in your own practice. You can, you, know, you can pick and choose the types of projects you do. And I want you to note the bottom row are all museums. So I do have an interest in, in um, culture and the distribution of cultural information. So working for the Getty Museum in Los Angeles or the LA County Museum. And also I went to London and worked at the V&A Museum on a new exhibition that had to do with British art and design. So you may find yourself working in all kinds of parts of the world and on all different kinds of products and all kinds of different subject matters. Right. So, so maybe getting back to, you know, what, what do you do as a, as a product manager, right? So, so Karen talked about the different kinds of companies, the different kinds of, of products and industries and so forth. Um, you know, I guess the one thing I can say is is that you know no two days are are exactly alike. Um, and so if you like a lot of variability, um, product management is a is a great career. But there are a couple dimensions on which you you operate. Um, and, and those are sort of, you know, is is what you're working on internally focused? Is it focused on the development of the product? or um, you know, interacting with stakeholders within your company, or are you really spending more time externally focused, right? Either um, you know, on your customers or on the market and those, those kinds of things. And then the other dimension is really uh, ranging from very tactically oriented activities, um, such as you know, running a validation test plan, or uh, you know, reviewing technical documentation to make sure you know you're not going to be confusing users about what it is your product does. To very strategic, uh, strategically oriented activities, like um, you know, market studies, uh, like you know, pitching a new uh, product idea to, to your CEO, um, you know, putting together the roadmap of, of your product. I mean, it, it really spans a, a, a great range here, and so I won't go through through all of these uh, things, but you know, just a, a couple to to call your attention to. Um, you know, on a daily basis, you know, some internally focused activities may be, um, you know, look, you've you've got a product out in the market. Um, all products have bugs or defects or, or things that you wish they didn't do. Uh, and so really reviewing what to do about those with your R&D or your engineering team is, is something that you'll be involved with. Um, and then making the decision about, is that product really ready to launch? Is it, is it ready for uh, availability? Um, 
th these are sort of internally focused kinds of things that you, you may be involved with. Uh, on, on the external side, um, you know, think about um, trade shows and conferences, um, speaking engagements where you're you're talking to uh, and really you know evangelizing about the benefits of of your product to external audiences or key opinion leaders. Um, th th this is sort of the the range of activities you you might be involved with um, as a product manager. Karen, okay. go ahead. So I'm going to show you a little bit about a product that I'm developing now. It's called Local Haze. It's a product that I've launched. It's available for free on the App Store. And what it does is an it's an application that crowdsources air quality uh, from sensors that are located worldwide, about 29 or just over 29,000 sensors now over six continents. And what, it, what the sensors do is they read air quality data, and then the application actually rates that data for confidence in the quality of the data. And the target users are consumers who are also citizen scientists. And the reason it's important is that particulate matter, or sometimes you'll hear the term PM, if it's really, really small, it can get into your lungs and do a lot of damage. And so this is a health risk. And so consumers need a way to monitor the quality of air, their air and measure the PM values. You can see on the left, the PM 2.5 particles are very, very small. You know, Many of them fit in the width of a human hair. And this is an issue with regard to health. So I'm going to show you um, a demonstration of the app running on an iPhone. So you launch it, and you can look through the sensors in your area. You could choose one, look at it in detail, or you could look at the sensors on a map, navigate all over the world. In this case, we'll look at Northern California because the wildfires are happening there. You can see the air quality is not good. And you can choose an area and what we call drill down. So we want to tap. We want to look in detail at the sensors there. And then we see the air is bad, we can look in detail there. So that's an example of the app running. And before you actually develop and launch a product like that, you have to really understand who is the user of your product. Really, who, who's going to use a product and why would they want to use a product and what their pain points are. And so we think about things in terms of what's the end user's need. In this case, these are consumers that are technical citizen scientists, so they know how to um, put these sensors on their porches and they know how to you know, they, they're looking for the data from these sensors. And we develop personas. We call them user models or personas. And you really want to understand key attributes. So, for example, you understand, you want to understand what are the frustrations and pain points that this particular persona has. In this case, you might have a persona where the family member has asthma and they're really worried about the air quality. Can they allow their children to go out and play soccer during the day? Or an elderly member of the family can go for a walk. Uh, or they're concerned about their local air quality for other reasons. And so you really want to understand that. And here's an example of what we develop as persona. So this is a persona for local haze. It's Craig, who's an air, what we call air quality enthusiast. And you can see the dimensions where we've really dug in and we've understood what are the pain points, what are the motivations that would drive a user to use your product, what are their goals, and what do they, what do they use in real life for applications? Does he use an iPhone X and an iPad and a MacBook? And you really have to understand many, many dimensional picture of your, of your user. And then how do you validate that? Well, you go out and you do research. Sometimes you'll hear user experience research called UXR. It's a great part of the field. If you like talking to people and you like exploring and finding out about what makes people you know, want to use technology or what makes them tick, it's a great role for you. And what you do is you spend time with end users. You can see me on the right. Here I am in Boston interviewing someone in South Station on the bottom, where it's actually in the middle of Boston winter, so you can see I'm wearing a scarf. Uh, and on top is in a lobby of a bank where we're testing out an app. We're asking open-ended questions because when you do research, you don't want to lead the user to the answer. You want to get their opinion if you're doing what's called a qualitative interview. Um, and you also want to observe how they might use the product or get their opinions about how they, if they were given a product with certain features, how they might use it. But well, you want to identify problems and propose solutions that pro you can work with product management and engineering to improve the product. At, at, at all times, you are going to be advocating for the user's needs. You need to be able to represent the needs of the user. And that can be very challenging in, in businesses. And you want to be able to prove or disprove hypotheses that you had about your, uh, about your persona. You maybe had assumptions about the way that your personas might uh, have particular problems or interests in specific features, and you need to validate that. 
This is an example of a journey map. So this is what designers will also do to sort of map the beginning, sort of middle and end of the product journey. Now also product managers do develop journey maps. I've worked on, on some projects where the product managers work together with design, but I just wanna show you an example of what we call artifact. This is a design artifact that shows the end-to-end -end journey of how someone might use local hay, starting with the very early part of the journey, which is the discovery, going through initial use, which is downloading the app and installing it, and then using features, using say maybe more complex features like the mapping uh, as they become more of a mastery or gain more mastery, and then eventually become an evangelist. They might share a map of air quality sensors out to their social media network. Great. So in addition to uh, some of the artifacts that, that Karen was talking about, um, it's also important to, to document to, to make sure that the engineering team knows what they need to build, right? And so product management is typically very involved um, in the development of, of identifying the user needs and really identifying the, the product requirements. And so um, I thought maybe we could walk through a little bit about, you know, what what in particular makes a good um, you know, product requirement, for example, and, and it's really being able to answer the questions on the left, right? Because um, engineering will, will come to you as the product manager when there's a question about, you know, should it be A or B, you know, should it be blue or red? And, and they're really looking for you to be able to provide that data, um, you know, that insight, um, you know, from users. You, in addition to design, are sort of representing users, um, you know, to the product realization process. So, so for example, um, so who needs this particular feature, right? Um, and, 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 and quite specifically, you heard Karen talk about the persona, right? And so the more you can, you can bring to life uh, your users to engineers, the, the better products they're gonna they're gonna help you build. You know what is it exactly that the that the uh, user is trying to do? You know what's what's the context? So for example, you know when uh, Dr. So and So performs a voice exam, um, you know she needs to to uh, record um, her visual impressions or something in real time, right? Okay, that's that's a little bit more meaty than you know the product must uh, record things, right? Um, you know, where is the user when they need to do this activity? Um, you know, where are they physically, right? They may be uh, in their office, they may be in an operating room. Uh, you know, clearly very different kinds of contexts there, or where are they virtually, right? You heard Karen talk about the different form factors. Are they trying to do this on their phone? Are they trying to do this on their big, you know, flat panel, uh, you know, a TV screen, right? These things make a difference in, in the design um, uh, and, and acceptability of the product. So when are they doing these things, right? How frequently, right? Is this something they have to do every single day? Or is this maybe a bit of a um, an outlaw? So, for example, um, you know, does the doctor need to use this feature on his or her daily rounds? Maybe they need to do it on their weekly, um, you know, M and M review, right? The um, morbidity, morbidity and mortality review, right? The, these kinds of things in, in medical environments. You know, why is this so important to the user, right? Is it um, is this something that's very much focused on on them getting their job done? Uh, for example, in in the medical world. Um, if you need to do something in order to be able to bill for your services, this is really critically important, right? Or if you need to do something in order to be able to provide, um, you know, uh, a, a good outcome for patients, right? Why is, is, is a very important question. And it's also good for, for you to understand, so how is the user doing this today? You know, uh, what, what kinds of things are they cobbling together or what kinds of other products are they using? What is their best alternative? And to the extent that you can provide visual examples um, uh, of, of these kinds of requirements, that's great, right? It could be a picture, it could be a hand-drawn picture um, or, or what have you. And then the, 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 the next piece of this is, as I mentioned earlier, there are always gonna be more user needs than you have time to create in any given release of the product, right? It's just, I don't know, some kind of immutable fact of, of, of nature. And, and so it's gonna be very important to be able to to represent the priority of, of these user needs that, that you're presenting to R&D, right? What happens if we don't do this, right? What's gonna be the impact on our market share or our brand or um, you know, our quarterly results? Um, you know, and, and who, who wants this, right? Are they willing to, to buy it? Um, you know, are, will we be able to increase our install base by this or are we just gonna keep our current customers happy, right? These are all kinds of 
uh, considerations that need to go into it. And then there's there's feasibility, right? Is is what I'm asking for technically feasible? You know, operationally feasible? Um, and does it fit in the schedule? These are all things that you'll need to be thinking about in terms of setting the priorities um, for your products. Okay, so uh, Laura talked a little bit about what product managers do. Um, if you're a designer, you're gonna be working on designing the product and making sure that the user experience is as seamless and as smooth as possible. And you can see on local haze, for example, when we first released the map, on the left is what the map looked like because we had too many nodes. And when you have too many nodes, it's too crowded. And so at different levels of scale, it really was not usable. And on the right here, you can see what we did. We had to uh, design a clustering algorithm to aggregate the sensor data and then reflect that in a something that shows the quality of the air for that particular region. And, and that's dependent on how uh, to what extent the user has zoomed in using the pinch and zoom gesture. So it, you don't have to get it perfect when you release the product, but when you hear feedback from users that the user experience is uh, needs work, you need to be able to release updates and enhancements, and that's what you're gonna be doing as part of your user experience practice. Also, you, some of you may be interested in marketing and branding. There is a lot of visual part of the design experience. This is the branding part of user experience for local Hay. so there's a visual language, there's iconography, there's color, there's shape, there's form, and it all has to work together in a great user experience. And that is also part of the design practice. There are lots and lots of roles in user experience, and I see new ones coming up frequently now. Um, there's UX design roles, which you may see also listed as product design. Um, you'll sometimes see them as UI design, but you're increasingly seeing UX as user experience, which is broader than UI. Remember I mentioned UI is really about what's on the screen and the pixels, what's going on with the pixels and maybe some of the components that you're interacting with. Interaction design, which is really about understanding how to shape behavior through flows and how the user actually proceeds through task flow. That's what I focus on. There's UXR, user experience research. I showed you some examples earlier. Visual design. Um, you'll also hear people with title of product design, and I do know people who are motion designers, and they just do the motion that happens in different parts of the user experience. There may be a dynamic transition from screen to screen, and that's a motion designer that would be working on that. You'll also see roles that are more focused on engineering, like, for example, UX engineer. They work on front-end development and prototyping, so they'll work with the designers to actually prototype new ideas and get them working in code. Uh, there may be branding roles that have to do with user experience. And I did, in a couple of engagements, work on con uh, with uh, designers who are actually have the title of content strategy. So they're working on the content or the, the written part of the user experience and responsible for maybe the content that's distributed as part of the product experience that's really synonymous with more uh, marketing and technical, maybe the documentation and technical part of the product. I also have recently heard of a new title called Growth UX Designer. That's a new title. And that's I'm, I'm seeing in businesses where uh, there is an outcome of growth that needs to happen in the business. And so they have product teams that are uh, focused around outcomes and growth as one of them and a designer whose role is really to help facilitate growth adoption in the product. This is a quote from Bob Goodman, who is a colleague of mine. He's currently the SVP of product at Virgin Pulse. You can look him up on LinkedIn. He's also a Tufts alum. But his quote is that um, he sees the UX increasingly as synonymous with product design, and he sees product management and product design under one product experience umbrella. So that's an interesting point of view. And note that when I worked with Bob at Microsoft in the design group, he was a user experience designer. Uh, and so he has moved into product. So you can see that there's movement into product management and also the other way. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, Karen showed us lots of different kinds of flavors of, of roles in the design uh, world. And I think there are, you know, those same kinds of flavors uh, in, in product management. And so um, what I have here is a, a little bit of a, a list of, you know, the, the taxonomy of roles. I mean, obviously, everybody um, makes their way in, into the, the field and, um, you know, maybe starting off in entry level. And so here you'll you'll hear folks with uh, titles like, you know, associate product manager or junior product manager or maybe even a product specialist. And then moving into a bit more of, a, you know, an individual contributor where you'll see, you know, product manager 
here. And, um, you know, sometimes folks w will have different titles in terms of, you know, a technical product manager or a product owner um, it, or, or maybe just a, a product manager or a product line manager. And then as you move your way up, there's often um, in addition to individual contributor responsibilities or maybe management responsibilities. Maybe you'll be managing a design team or managing, um, you know, a, a small team of, of product managers, right? So you may become a group manager or a director or something of that nature. And then and then there are a sort of executive uh, um, uh, roles like a, a chief product officer, for, for example, you'll, you'll see, or vice, vice presidents. But, you know, one of the things that's, that's very interesting, I mentioned this a bit earlier, is sort of the um, you know, the differences in terms of, you know, what you may do as a product manager. There's also a lot of differences in terms of what you may be called. Um, I have been, you know, during my career, done almost exactly the same thing and been called, you know, a product manager, um, a product line manager, a, a product marketing manager. So it really d d depends. There are sometimes some subtle differences. Uh, you know, is, is a product manager working in the upstream area of, of um, a, a company? You may be focused more on the creation of, of the product. If you are a product manager on more of the downstream marketing um, areas of, of a business, you may be more focused on not so much what is in the product, although you'll have influence on that, but really helping customers understand how to use that product or, or telling the story of that product. And so um, th there, there's a lot of uh, differences. So, you know, certainly as, as you, um, if, if you uh, are interested in the field and, you know, maybe you'll have interviews and so forth, you really, when you're talking with companies, you really want to understand what do they mean by, by product manager? You know, where, where do they have their product managers focusing? Is it, is it more on the business side? Is it more on the product side? Is it more on the sales? Um, and external user side. And uh, I saw there was a, a question in the chat. Um, maybe I'll just sort of address it quickly here. There's a, there's a question about, you know, Scrum and what, what you know, what that's like in the, in the product realization, uh, um, you know, uh, process. And so, um, yes, there's definitely a bit of a difference in, in the way that you approach product management. But there's a lot of similarities. So, for example, the last bullet I have here is really around product owner versus product manager. Y you may find that in a scrum based um, uh, company that you may be called a product owner. And in my experience, folks in those roles uh, typically will work very, very much more internally, you know, internally focused with R&D and with design and really on a lot of the day to day activities. Um, in in developing um, a, a product, but but I've also seen it at work where you may have um, two in a box, where you may have someone who is focused as a product owner working alongside a product manager who has that external focus. And so, uh, companies who are you know very deeply involved in the, in the Scrum methodology may have um, an organization like that. But okay, Karen. Yeah. Okay, we'll go on. Ah, yeah, so so here, um, so how are we doing on time here? Well, it's about 11.35. Okay. So we so have about it, maybe five more minutes or Okay, yeah, so, so, so let me kind of hurry through this and I'd be happy to talk talk with anybody, uh, you know, who may have, have interest uh, in, in product management, but, but, but I have sort of this next series of three slides because I wanted to give you a flavor for, you know, what do these job descriptions look like when you're at the associate or the product manager or or the senior level? And and so it really comes down to I think a bit of the the scope of the role, um, how much uh, autonomy there is. You know, so certainly as you start out as a, an associate product manager, you'll be supporting activities. You'll be working with more senior product managers. Um, you know, this particular role seems to be a bit more of a downstream oriented product manager role. So there's there's a lot of activity around supporting sales and supporting um, the, the product once it has been released. Um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what, what are the, the credentials needed to, to get into this? Um, certainly, it, it's been my experience that, that a bachelor's degree is sort of uh, table stakes. It, it depends on the field that's required. Uh, this one, uh, you know, is, is sort of the, the marketing business side. And then there's also this, um, you know, notion of, of a couple years of experience um, potentially on the product development or application support side. So let's go to the next one just just quickly. Um, 
you know, he, here you're a bit more of, of managing activities, right? Some some day to day activities. Um, you know, here we see, you know, not only are are they looking for a bachelor's degree in, in a related field, but you know, they're they're starting to to be interested in a, a master's degree, perhaps on a, a technical. Uh, side or even an MBA, you know, a, a business oriented degree. So here we're looking for a little more experience related typically to the product that you may be working on, but not always. Um, and then now you start to see mm, they're, they're interested in some travel and and some extracurricular uh, work potentially on, on evenings and weekends. And then as you move into the senior space, you know, you are the the expert here. Um, you're, you're, you're leading, um, you know, you're recommending you're informing the teams on on new technologies and so forth. You're you're driving the business really. So so you're the one sort of, um, you know, creating these these programs and moving them forward. You're you're participating in strategic planning. You know, sometimes this is actually a bit more of an upstream um, a role. This this is a role that would be typical of of one in in my organization. Um, you know, here we're looking for a bit more on the technical side. So a STEM um, degree. Um, you know seven to ten years of, of experience really looking for that MBA um, not required but but you know really looking for it and then you know some some both domestic and international travel so a uh, quick quick overview and and my last plug on the next slide Karen is uh, really just um, I think we have a, a slide that um, lists the the career page for Olympus Medical um, and for those of you who may be interested there there are spring 22 co-op and intern uh, positions that will be opening up soon so I would encourage you if you have an interest to uh, take a look so back to you Karen all right thank you so you can see that um, some of the requirements to look at getting those PM roles. Uh, on the UX side, the important skills that you have to have are listening and having empathy for users when you're asking good questions in your research, not talking over people and not answering their questions for them. I've seen that happen. Uh, you're working as part of a team. So you see PM and engineering as your partners and your ability to collaborate with them. Uh, understanding the business requirements, that's a really important one. When you work with a really strong product management leader. So in my experience with working with Laura, she's a really strong product leader. She engenders more confidence into the org and it makes me a better designer. And I feel like you wanna seek out those kind of product leaders to work with. Uh, you have to understand the metrics, metrics of success. In other words, what will your, what success metrics will your products be measured on in terms of in the market or engagement with users, but also failure metrics, if there are particular things that are happening that shouldn't be happening. And you always want to advocate for users' needs in an org, especially when design may be one of many competing priorities and it may not get the kind of attention it needs. And you can definitely see that in some products. So uh, I have a, a similar slide and, you, and you'll see some very similar themes here for, for product management, right? You know, having that curiosity about what users are doing, that empathy, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to advocate, um, you know, for someone if, if you don't truly understand what it is that they're trying to do um, and, um, you know, really have some empathy for, for the struggles. And you saw in one of Karen's earlier slides, she's talking about frustration or friction points, right? You know, you, you have to have some empathy for those those kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, on the other hand, it's also important as, as the, the product manager to really, you know, be able to, um, you know, envision what something might be, right? So, so you're 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 working sometimes in in the world of what is, and in the, in the world of what can be, and and so having the ability to be able to, to 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 think of what that future might be, and to paint that picture for others on your team is a is a great skill. Um, Karen mentioned a bit, you know, being able to gain the respect and credibility, um, you know. You will you will get a lot of data as a product manager, right? You'll be talking to customers and designers and all of your colleagues, and they will all have lots of opinions about what exactly you should be doing with your product. And this is great. This is this is what you need. But you also need to have that filter level, right, or that filter capability to be able to to sort of distill it down into these are the most important things, and to be able to make decisions. Sometimes you're asked to make decisions, um, you know, between two great alternatives, and sometimes you have to make decisions between things that, you know, you really kind of have to hold your nose and, and pick one. And these are really important skills 
for for product management to have and and there are lots of skills but but maybe those are a couple that i'll, I'll call out here um today all right so we're just going to quickly take you through our backgrounds i started at tufts i got a degree in computer science i went into software engineering on the on the sort of ui layer i worked uh, on a pen and voice system and then I did a master's at the Media Lab on, on gesture interfaces for devices, and then uh, have started a long career in both the UX practice and entrepreneurship. So I started a company out of uh, MIT. And and for for, for me, um, you know, as I sort of uh, alluded to earlier, um, you know, I, I've been in a lot of different companies. I started off uh, as as a software engineer in in tech companies, big ones and little ones, and lots of different companies. And then I made the shift into product management at, at a at a startup in, in one of those tech companies, and then moved into medical technology, medical device, uh, where I've had roles both in product management, you know, individual contributors, um, you know, leading teams, and also you know, full stack marketing. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Karen and I met in the MIT ecosystem. Um, after that, I also um, went ahead and, and created, you know, my own company for and, and, and did some consulting for various uh, companies and then um, have most recently moved uh, from a bit of the, you know, focus in product management and now really more on the, the business um, aspects, right? Being a general manager of a business that includes product managers. So um, that's a bit about how my career has gone. So uh, I just want everybody to understand there are many paths to user experience careers. You can start out and get formal design training. You'll hear of HCI, human computer interaction. You might see that in your university curriculum. So you can go to school, you can do a boot camp, you can get job experience. I've also seen product managers become UX designers and vice versa. You can start off in engineering and end up as a UX designer. You can start in marketing. I also see some people starting in customer success with a strong interest in product, especially in SaaS or PLG or product-led growth businesses, and then pursuing careers as designers. The same story uh, for, for product management, right? The, the, the way people come to product management is 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 wide, right? So so we've talked about the, the technical realm, right? I mean, that that's how I did it. Um, you also see folks who are product experts, right? They, you may be involved in customer support or application support. You know, Karen talked about the UX and design. Um, also, in some companies, uh, if, if you have a pre-sales role or a sales role and, and you get a lot of expertise on a particular product, I've seen I've seen that path as as well. Um, and then there are some products for which what they're really looking for is a great deal of domain expertise, right? You know, for example, um, in order to be uh, the product manager for a particular respiratory um, you know, a, a device, they may be looking for folks who have a, um, a career path in respiratory technology, for example. Um, so, so it really runs the gamut. There are also folks who come to product management pretty much right out of school, right? Um, and so um, th there's a way to get in for everybody, right? And, and everybody's uh, path is, is, is a bit different. So our closing thoughts, uh... We think there's circuitous paths to both product management and UX careers. Uh, as Laura noted, there's a breadth of experience that's really an asset in product management. Both UX and PM require empathy. Uh, in Laura's bullet here, it's empathy and curiosity. You have to understand how to put yourself in someone else's shoes, similar to UX. Uh, UX really requires really strong advocacy for the users of your product and being able to collaborate well with your partners in product management and engineering and other parts of the business. And like I said earlier with that diagram, there's a really strong overlap between product management, UX design and engineering, but we do see plenty of opportunities in the tech business. Anything you'd like to add, Laura, before we close? Yeah, maybe just a, sort of a, you know, a point on, on a personal note. I mean, I've been a product manager um, in my career for, you know, for, for a long time. And, and for me, I found product management really the perfect nexus between, um, you know, my, my interest in technology. So, you know, get to be a little um, nerdy with, with the technology, um, you know, my interest in, in, in people, right. I, I was a psych major. Um, and then also, you know, my interest in business, uh, you know, really creating products, not just to create products, but really to create successful products, commercially successful products. And, and um, you know, if, if those kinds of things sound interesting to you, product management is a, is a great field. And there are 
many ways you can take uh, it, you know, after product management, right? Um, th there are lots of paths into and out of product management. So that's, that's my plug for product management. All right. Thank you. We're going to look at the questions and see if we can answer a couple. Uh, do we have time, Asla, to well, answer a few questions? I'm going to look a bit over time, but I think Hillary's question was answered in the last slide. So, um, okay. And uh, then that's the answer as well. Uh, there's, I, Rujang is wondering um, what the step availability refers to in Laura's eight, early wow. slides on the product development time now. Does it yeah. uh, refer to inclusive design? Yeah, well, certainly we, we think that inclusive design should be should be part of the product realization process. But, but what I meant by availability is there are sometimes a product will be available for things like alpha testing or beta testing or manufacturing pilot um, and, and so forth, maybe before it's launched to users. Right. Sometimes you may have a bit of a soft launch or, um, you know, a, a, a constrained launch, if you will. And that, that's what I meant. So I sort of broke out availability and launch a, a bit. Um, some companies you may see that see it lumped together. But but that's what I meant by that. All right. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you attending our talk. Thank and, you for uh, this great talk uh, and being with us today uh, and attending the ET. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Th thank you, Asla, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, I had a, a great time, and yeah. thank you, Karen. Thank you.